Okay, let's configure some static routes. We're going to drop a router onto our network. And actually, I'm going to put some switches down too, just so it kind of looks like a real network. And I think this only has two ports. I'm going to add some. go. And we'll actually add some more too. So what we'll do is bring these a little smaller. And actually, let's do this. We'll connect them. Start all these up. And we'll actually put the switches after that. There we go. It's a little more realistic. And let's connect this in here. Okay, so now we have some networks. And so we'll we'll IP these and get these going. On that top one, we'll do clockwise and just make up some uh, make up some networks here. So this could be So now what I'm doing is we're just going to create some networks for these switched uh, these switched networks that are on our second routers here. So that way when we're on the central router we can assign some static routes that will go through these routers and to these remote networks. So we're just going into each of these fast ether ones and I'm giving it a list of similar networks. And we're no shutting those interfaces. There we go. OK. 
Okay. So the way the routing works, we're going to have to have these links here between our two routers. This, uh, this inner ring needs to have an IP scheme for each of these links as well. Uh, now often these will be a serial link when you're talking about routers, but uh, for a wide area network uh, you, you would have something like that. I'm going to pretend here we have different buildings and the top one is like building one and building two and building three and building four. And this is like our central office in the middle. Uh, so the ethernet, you know, they're, that's still valid you know, in that kind of idea or something like that. So we're just sticking with uh, copper ethernet for this example. Uh, we'll break into the serial WAN connections later on. Uh, so let's come up with some uh, connections here. So since these are um, since these are point-to-point -point links essentially, uh, even though these are running Ethernet, really these are only two devices that are on it. Uh, remember before I mentioned the slash 30 networks that we could use. So we want to try and use as few IPs as possible to uh, prevent waste. Uh, so for these links, I'm going to use slash 30s. Uh, these are slash 24s we created. I'm going to make some slash 30s here so that there's two usable IPs on each network. So each link here is going to be its own network, and each network will just have two usable IPs. So we'll go into our first router, and we'll configure it that way. And I'm just going to use a 10 dot network for that. That way, we have a completely different IP scheme between the two, uh, between the two different types of routes we're going to have. Because the central router is going to have directly connected networks that show 10 something, and then we're going to create static routes for 192.168 something. So we're going to do 10 0 0 0. Well, this will be the interfaces dot one. Okay. So we'll do that'll be dot one dot two dot zero. So that'll be thirteen. So we have those up. So now we have to go into these individual routers, and we're going to have to give them the same IPs uh, on the same networks. So zero zero. So we're up on this top router here. So we're doing this interface here zero zero. Whoops, that was a ten dot zero zero, and the other one was dot one. So this is dot two. Good. 
go to our main router and we're going to check our IP route. So now we have four directly connected networks. Uh, dot zero is this one here. We have the dot four network, which is here, dot eight, and dot twelve. So those two usables you saw me configuring that was dot one, dot two, and dot five and six, and dot nine and ten, and thirteen and fourteen. Okay, so what we can do now is we'll take a look at one of our routers. We'll take a look at this routing table. Whoops. All right, so this router knows things that this router does not. And we're just going to ignore the duplex errors popping up right now. It's fine. So this router knows about networks that this central router does not because he's directly connected to these this switch network, which is 192.168.something. In this example, it's dot two. So what we're going to do is create a static route on the central router so that it knows that in order to get to the 192.168.2. network, to go talk to this router over here. So what we'll do is we're going to configure those static routes now. So in order to do so, you've seen this done with the default gateway uh, gateway blast resort configuration already. So it's IP route and then our destination network. So I'm going to do the top one first. So that's 192.168.1.0, 255, 255, 255, 0. So that's our subnet mask. And then I have to give it a destination. Uh, and remember, uh, it's preferable that you define the interface as well as the IP address for it to leave. So this is going to be, I believe it was the interface it wants first. Yep, okay. So it's going to be fasteth01 and then the other router was at 10.0.0.2. So that interface. So we're leaving FA01. We're talking to 10.0.0.2 over here in order to get to this network up here. And then we're going to do the same thing for that two dot network on the right side. We're going to go out one slash zero. And we're going to talk to, he was dot six. And then for that bottom one, that was dot three. And we're going to go out the two slash zero interface. And that was dot 10. And that last one was dot four on the left, and we're gonna go out to our zero zero interface, and that was dot fourteen. So if we show our routes now, we have the static routes we we're talking about. So we have some directly connected, we have some statics, as well as the actual network and the prefix. We have our uh, administrative distance and metric. We have what the IP address is of the next top interface, so our next top destination there, and the interface we're going out. So there's all our information that we just configured. Uh, so what will happen at this point is if I were to try to uh, put a host on one of these switches and we wanted to ping that host, uh, if I did that, the traffic would go from this central router out to this router. So now it knows how to get to 192.168.4. something. It would get to here, but then it would it would also then go out onto this switch network. It would go to the host. The host would then respond back, send it to the switch. It would hit the router, and then the router would drop it. And you say, well, why would that happen? And it, that would happen based upon how what kind of traffic were generated from here. So 
If we pinged directly from this router, it would probably work because it would the traffic would be generated starting from most likely this one of these 10 dot address here. So 10 0 0 12 it would probably originate from. Uh, so it would return traffic, but if we had it a had a network connected off of this router and this was an actual like central office network, uh, this in turn would have its own IP scheme uh, and we can create it to display that. So I'm going to create a switch and I don't think I have any interfaces left, <laughs> but if I did, uh, I could then connect an additional interface from this router to the switch. This would then have its own subnet, so this could be 192.168.5 or something like that. This router then, if I were to originate traffic from here through this router to this router to this network, the return traffic would go from this network to this router and then drop because this router doesn't know where this subnet came from. So in order to fix that we would then have to put return routes on all of these uh, outside ring routers. So routers uh, 2, 3, 4, 5, they are going to have to have an additional route pointing back to this network here at the central office. So we would have to do basically the same thing uh, on each of these individual routers. We'd have to say IP route, you're trying to get to the central office network, which, you know, we're just making this up right now, but it would be 5.0. And you need to go out our FASTD00 interface to do that. And his IP was 10.00. Dot, uh, what was that? 13. So if I were to do this directly from the router though, it'll generate it from that interface. Uh, so it, the return traffic will work because it will say it came from here. And this router obviously knows who that is because he's directly connected to it. But I wanted to give that example for a network that's outside of uh, the actual router. There's also a uh, feature, since we're talking about differences of ping and stuff like that, there's also a feature in these uh, routers. If you type ping just with nothing else, you can do what's called an extended ping, and uh, you have a bunch of different options in here, including telling it what interface or what IP address it's originating from. So you can, from this router, say, I want to ping this switch 8 network over here. I could say, okay, I'm going to do that, but I'm going to originate the traffic and pretend it came from this interface. And what that does is it helps us test our internal routing table because it will originate from here go through my routing process and then go out the correct interface. Otherwise it'll just go out the nearest interface. So this is actually pretty handy. So we can say IP, I'm trying to talk to uh, dot four, whoops, four dot fourteen. How many times I want to do it, what size, some timeout info, extended, say yes. Now I can say what interface do I want it to come from. So I could say this could be coming from my dot one interface which is this one up here so it's going to go from up here through my router through this interface and hopefully hit uh, this side of this router actually oh, that's because I'm on I'm on router five that's why <laughs> let me do it from the right router that would be helpful Andrew yeah all right, so let's do this. Ping, I'm going to ping 192.168. 4. Dot, man, I'm just not typing correctly here. 4. Dot, uh, that was 4.1 actually. Was this one. So, we're going to get to 4.1. So, yeah, that's all fine extend commands yes and I'm going to start that from this interface up here so that was 10.0.0.1 I believe there we go and you can just skip through most of this stuff unless you want to change it and then it's going to try to ping and so that didn't work so what we would have to do would be to go into router 5 and I'll see if I can wait for this one to cancel out and I'll show you 
where in our routing table we'd have to fix that. The reason that didn't work is because of what we talked about before where the if it hits the child routes it'll drop if it doesn't match. So router 1, I started to ping from FastEtho1 through my router out FastEth00 to his FastEth00 and then tried to ping this FastEth01 over here. So I tried to hit this interface from this interface. And it probably, if I were to capture the traffic, it probably made it there. But then on the return traffic, the router tried to send it back and it checked its route table and it said, okay, I need to get back to 10.0.0.1. Oh, it matches 10.0.0. Uh, does it match 10.0.0.12? No. And drop. So that's what happened there. Uh, I would expect if we add a route in here to that 10.0.0 network it should work and that was available via what was that? That was dot thirteen, I believe. We'll try that. Whoops. <laughs> Ping, there we go. Target IP. Extended shore. I'm going to come from my O one. There we go. Now it works. So that was the problem there. That's a, this is a good example of the amount of overhead necessary in order to make static routing work in a large environment. We only have five routers here. And in order to get traffic to come from this little network and ping this network, I have to add a route back to there. Same thing for this network. Same thing for this network. Same thing for this network. And then for each router, so for each of these outside routers, I'd have to add a route to every other 10 dot network as well as every other 192.168 network. So you end up having a lot of manual configuration to do that. I mean, we could we'd be putting in a dozen routes statically just to make that work. The better way to do that would be to go through dynamic routes. So then it would do it for you automatically. So that's what we'll get into coming up. One of the things we can do to make our lives easier, though, is uh, you can do summary routes. So, if we take a look at this, we have some 192.168 networks, and they all are consecutive. So we have dot one, dot two, dot three, dot four. You can describe all these route, all these 192.168 routes, with a single route that would encompass all of them because it would have a larger subnet mask and that subnet mask would then match multiple subnets. Uh, the only downfall would be in this situation uh, it could only go one direction so if we had one route we'd have to say it would go one way so it would really only work if uh, if we were on say like router 3 and we made a summary route so that it could get to the networks at switch 5, switch 8, and switch uh, what is this? <laughs> Switch 7, I think. It's kind of goofy looking. Uh, 